thank you for coming. What a great crowd. Um, my name's Nathan Richards. I'm the program head for the, Maritime, uh, for the Maritime Heritage Program here at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. And I'm also uh, an associate professor uh, in the program of Maritime Studies at East Carolina University. I uh, really appreciate you coming out tonight. I'd like to thank some sponsors before we start uh, the talk. I'd like to thank the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Uh, this is a collaboration with Downtown Books, and I'd like to thank Jamie for uh, helping us set this up. Uh, I'd like to thank Bill Massey. I think he's here. Uh, he's the, uh, he, he works with our foundation at CSI, and he's the person that brought the, the book to our attention. So I'd like to thank him. Viking Press, uh, who published, published the book, and also the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary uh, for helping us out uh, with this project. Uh, for those of you that don't, don't know, um, in 2008, uh, the Monitor National Marine Sanctuary started a project under the uh, leadership of Joe Hoyt, who we're lucky to have here tonight, uh, to do a, an inventory of all the World War II wrecks off of North Carolina. And that's been an ongoing study. And so um, after the talk tonight, uh, you, some of you have already seen this, we have an exhibit area to show a lot of the, uh, a lot of the footage, a lot of the, the data from that collaborative pro project, which has got a lot of partners, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, CSI, ECU, uh, Submerged Resources Centre of the National Park Service has been involved, a lot of different, uh, different agencies. Um, and hence, th that's the reason why we're uh, happy to have William Giroux Giro here tonight. Um, we, we've been doing a lot of work on the shipwrecks and archaeologists get very focused on the details, uh, the details of the objects that we're looking at. And we're often accused of uh, not seeing the people. And so when I was able to read the book, it was from that other perspective, the people that were on the vessels that in many cases we're studying when we're on the, on the bottom of the ocean uh, surveying the archaeological sites. A little bit about Mr. Giroux uh, before I let, let him talk um, is that he worked, he was a reporter for the uh, Richmond Times Dispatch for over 25 years uh, and also worked for the Maersk mm -hmm. for a number of years. Uh, and so he's... Uh, uh, a local to the area, knows a lot about, uh, about the region, and um, I'll turn it over to, to him. Thank you. Right. Thank, you. Well, uh, thank you very much, and thank you all for coming out. Can you hear me all right? Yes, yes sir. Okay. Um, my name's Bill Giroux, and my book, The Matthews Men, is really the story of the heroics and the sacrifices of the U.S. Merchant Marine during World War II. And I tell the story through the adventures of sort of an offbeat brotherhood of sea captains and mariners from Matthews County, Virginia. And some of you may be familiar with Matthews County. It's a, a few hours from here. It's a little tiny outpost on the Chesapeake Bay. It's about 70 miles from Richmond, but it's, a, it's an outpost. Even today, it's like the land that time forgot. There is, uh, there's nothing in Matthews, and Matthews is not on the way to anywhere. <laughs> and the people in Matthews have a saying that one never goes to Matthews unless going to Matthews. <laughs> so Matthews has always been more a part of the water than the land. And because it's so isolated, there's not much to do there. You can farm or you can fish or you can join the Merchant Marine. And for that reason, since before the American Revolution, Matthews has been a cradle of merchant sea captains and merchant mariners. Now, a merchant mariner, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, a merchant mariner is not a member of the military. Um, they're private citizens, civilians, and they work for private shipping companies, hauling cargo from, coast, from port to port for profit. Um, during the war, the merchant marine really is sort of becomes an adjunct of the military. And that was especially true during World War II. The merchant marine was called upon to haul vital war supplies. Oil, guns, ammunition, planes, tanks, food, medical supplies, bug repellent, pretty much everything that the Allied armies needed to survive and fight in the foreign battlefields. Merchant marine was the supply line. And for that reason, everywhere these men sailed, everywhere the, Mer the Matthews men and the Merchant Mariners sailed, in the European theater of the war, they were attacked by German U-boats. 
And the U-boat's mission was to try to cut the supply line, which is try to prevent America from projecting its industrial power across the ocean to Europe, because the Germans knew if that happened, they'd lose the war. So the Matthews men and their shipmates were attacked in the Arctic on the way to Murmansk in Russia, because Russia was our ally at that point. Um, they were attacked in the South Atlantic off Cape Town, South Africa, off Brazil, uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Caribbean, all along the U.S. and Gulf Coast of the United States. And some people around here know that pretty well, that the U-boats came right up to the shore here. They sank ships right off the coast. Uh, one U-boat commander got close enough to the Ferris wheel in Coney Island to be able to see the Ferris wheel. Um, the U-boats would frame American ships, the silhouettes of them, against the lights of our coastal cities, for, frame them up for torpedo strikes, you know, like ducks in a shooting gallery. They attacked ships right off my hometown of Virginia Beach and right off the Outer Banks. They torpedoed numerous ships right off Cape Hatteras. They torpedoed ships at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Um, so many ships were getting torpedoed and so many mariners were being killed at the beginning of the war that a publisher of Merchant Mariner's textbooks hurried into print a little volume called How to Abandon Ship. And this was a step-by-step -step guide to how to avoid getting killed when your ship was torpedoed. And this had, it covered all sorts of topics. It covered a topic of, for example, of how to survive if you were marooned on a deserted island in the Arctic. And it had a section about how to kill and eat polar bears. And for the record, you shoot a polar bear right behind the shoulder blades to pierce his heart. You do not shoot him in the water because you're not going to be able to get him out. You don't cook him because he's too tough. You got to eat him raw. And above all, no matter how hungry you are, avoid polar bear liver. Now, there's no record of a marooned merchant crew ever killing and eating a polar bear, or vice versa. But the fact that these guys put this in the book will maybe give you an idea of how bad things were. At the beginning of the war, the merchant mariners were sort of let down by the country. We didn't protect them. We sent them out most of the time just hoping they wouldn't encounter a U-boat. And at the end of the war, we sort of forgot about them. So the Matthews men is, is their story. And I've written the story, I've written it sort of like a seagoing adventure story. That's how I see it. These guys were doing their job. They faced an enormous challenge. They passed through the fire and they, you know, they helped save the world. But I spent years researching the book and I hope that in the telling of the story that the reader will come away with an appreciation for what these merchant mariners and their families went through and maybe make you a little bit mad that they didn't get treated better from, uh, for all they endured. Um, the book has more than 70 photos and some of them are family photos from attics and steamer trunks in Matthews and others are action shots from the uh, National Archives and different museums. And I'd like to show you a few of the photos in the book now that I think will give you a feel for what the book is like. This is the ring, and this is a heavy gold signet ring, and it bears the initials GDH. And GDH stands for George Dewey Hodges. And Dewey, as everyone called him, is a Matthews County sea captain. He's one of the seven brothers in the subtitle of the book. And Dewey was wearing this ring in July 1942 when his little tanker was torpedoed by a U-boat off the coast of Cuba, and he was killed. He was lost, as they say. Sometime thereafter, this ring, along with some human remains, was discovered in the belly of a big shark, caught in the same waters where Dewey's ship was torpedoed. The ring was returned to Virginia, returned to Dewey's family by some very well-intentioned people. One of them wrote, if the widow of the good old man who went down with this ship knows this ring, I think it would be of, you know, it would, it would help with some closure. 
But unfortunately, the return of the ring to the family caused more pain and confusion than it did anything else. This is Dewey, the owner of the ring. Uh, Dewey, to me, epitomizes some of the best qualities of the Matthews men, the mariners of Matthews County. He had very little formal education. He finished only the fourth grade. But he managed to rise to the peak of his profession to command a merchant ship. And in Matthews, a seafaring community where they had these traditions, commanding a merchant ship was the, considered the highest calling that a man could aspire to. Dewey was an excellent captain, and he was also a decent guy. He wasn't, some captains were tyrants the minute the ship left the port. But Dewey always uh, looked out for men, and he tried to hire men for Matthews whenever he could, because it was hard to find a job in Matthews. Anytime he came home to Matthews from his ship for the weekend, he would put out word all around the county of any jobs he had available on his ship, or any jobs he had any, knew of anywhere else on the docks. And if a man was interested, all he had to do was be standing outside the corner drugstore in Matthews at 1 p.m. on Sunday, the day Dewey was going back to his ship. He would pull up, open the door to his car, the man would get in, and Dewey would drive him to the docks and sign him on a ship. And that was just one of the ways in which Matthews, which had a population of only about 7,000, 7,500 people, managed to spread merchant mariners on ships all over the world's ocean. These guys were everywhere. Um, Dewey's whole family was at sea. And these are the seven Hodges brothers and their formidable father. Uh, Dewey is the third from the left on the top row. He's looking very formal in his uh, captain's uniform, but normally he was sort of a jovial, joking guy. But there was nothing jovial about this guy. And this is Captain Jesse Hodges, the father of the Matthews men, the patriarch of the Hodges family. Captain Jesse, as everybody called him, was a tough tugboat captain. I mean, he was a, a master mariner, but he was an SOB. <laughs> he didn't suffer fools or greenhorns or idlers or really anybody gladly. And I'll show you a little better picture of him. When I was a, uh, working on this book, one of his grandsons gave me this picture of him, and I hung it right up over my computer, my workstation. And any day that I felt like quitting early for the day, I would sort of look up and <laughs> see Captain Jesse, and he would give me this, this stare, and I would think, all right, I'll, I'll work a little bit longer. You know, he just had that, he had that effect on people. He had gone to sea at the age of 10, 10, and he spent most of his life on a tugboat. He very rarely came home for more than a couple of days at a time, a couple of times a year, to visit his long-suffering wife, Henrietta, and his family. And when he did come home, he was pretty clueless in all matters related to land, with one exception. Every time he came home, he seemed to leave Henrietta with another child. <laughs> the family had 14 children in all, and the children accumulated so quickly that the Hodges ran out of names. And they named their 14th and last child Hilda 14 Hodges. Now, Captain Jesse encouraged all seven of his sons to go to sea. Encouraged being kind of a mild word. This was what you needed to do to make something of yourself. And six of the seven boys ended up becoming captains of ships. And the seventh, Spencer, was on that track, but he hurt his back badly in a shipboard accident on his brother Dewey's ship, and he had to come ashore. Um, all of the Hodges brothers are very different, like brothers and, or siblings in a lot of families, but I would like to leave the book to introduce you to the other brothers. I do want to show you Henrietta, Captain Jesse's wife and the matriarch of the Hodges family. Now Henrietta, or Henny as everyone called her, is one of my favorite characters in the book. She is not a mariner, but she is the glue that held the family together. And in Matthews, the women were the ones, the men were always gone, they were always on their ships. It was the women that had to hold the family together. And Henny worked 
pretty much night and day, every day of her life, not only rearing this family that Captain Jesse kept adding to and leaving her to deal with, but she also ran the Hodges 60-acre farm in Matthews. And this farm was an outpost of an outpost. It had no electricity, no running water, no indoor plumbing, no phone, no uh, radio, nothing. Everything had to be done at the farm the old-fashioned way. And Henny was in charge of all of it. And here she is uh, churning butter in the company of one of the Hodges' goats. And the, the farm, they also raised hogs and chickens there. Um, Henny was regarded by her children and grandchildren as superhuman. One of the grandchildren told me that when he was growing up, he said, I honestly thought if I had cut my arm off by accident, she could have fixed it. <laughs> but she had, Henny had known a very hard life. She had uh, three of her children, three of the 14, had died at a young age. And Henny had actually watched two of them die right before her eyes. Mm -hmm. So whether it was that, or just the general difficulty of her life, she was given to spells of crying. And three or four times a day, without any immediate provocation, she would break down and just sob. And she would do it quietly, away from anybody, but she would, her shoulders would shake and they would find her out. Um, unfortunately, the U-boat war would provide her with more occasion for sorrow. Um, the Hodges were only one of a number of Matthews families that had multiple people on merchant ships. The Callis family had maybe a dozen sea captains from Matthews, including three brothers. There were three Hammond brothers who went to sea, and those three Hammond brothers were torpedoed a total of four times on four different ships in a space of only three months. Um, at the peak of the U-boat war, Pretty much every family in Matthews either had a loved one on the deck of a merchant ship or a close friend. And for that reason, Matthews experienced the U-boat war to its absolute fullest. That's okay. Um, here is a U-boat. And this photograph was probably taken by a Nazi propaganda photographer. They often would ride U-boats with the idea of, you know, they'd chronicle their destruction for the folks back home, burning ships, sinking ships. This U-boat is plowing through a rough sea in pursuit of a merchant ship. And this is a very unequal contest, probably did not end well for the merchant ship. Most of the merchant ships at the beginning of the war were old, they were slow, um, they were unprotected for the first, much of the first year of the war, and they were unarmed. Some of them had Navy gun crews, but un through no fault of the gun crews, Putting a gun crew on a merchant ship was not a good way to protect it from U-boats. And a lot of these Navy gunners died right beside the, the merchant mariners. Um, the U-boat was faster than pretty much any merchant ship on the sea, and it was armed to the teeth. It had uh, torpedoes, of course, and a lot of these U-boats had deck cannons. This one doesn't have it, but these fearsome cannons that were mounted on the foredeck. And these cannons could sink ships by themselves without even the you know, the uh, um, U-boat commander having to resort to a precious torpedo. But U-boats have kind of a mystique about them. People think of, oh, U-boats as these ultimate weapons. But one of the things I try to do in the book is to show that U-boats really had a lot of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. They weren't submarines the way we think of submarines today, like the nuclear subs, the boomers that can stay underwater for months at a time without even communicating with the outside world. U-boats were diving vessels. They functioned a lot better on the surface, but they could switch over to battery power, kind of like a Prius, and submerge for brief periods of time to conduct attacks or to try to escape from pursuers. But they were slower than most of the warships that chased them, and if they were driven underwater um, and discovered, then they were pretty helpless, and they had to depend on the, the trickery of the U-boat commander to keep them from being sunk. And if you've ever seen the great German movie Das Boot, you see the U-boat men and the submarine cowering as depth charges are exploding all around them. And if one gets too close, that's the end. Um, life in a U-boat was brutal. The air was foul. The food was rancid. 
the U-boat was so cramped that the men literally slept on top of torpedoes that were stored under their bunks. Um, and every, all of the U-boat's operating systems had to be done just right. Everything had to be done in a, just the right sequence, and any deviation from that could doom the U-boat. And this extended to the U-boat's toilets, which everyone on every U-boat utterly despised. And there is one case that I describe in the book, although I promise not in a lot of detail, where an improperly flushed toilet sank a U-boat. Um, this next photo, uh, this shows what a U-boat could do to a ship at sea. This is a, an American cargo ship, the Thomas McKean, being pummeled by a U-boat. The U-boat's already torpedoed the Thomas McKean and is finishing it off with its deck cannon. And what I'd like you to think about when looking at this picture is what it must have been like to be a merchant mariner on one of these ships under attack and try to escape with your life. It was a very difficult challenge. Uh, the torpedo strike, the first one, often would come in the dead of night with no warning. The torpedo would explode. It would often set the ship on fire. Um, depending on what the ship's cargo was, the cargo might explode. It might blow the ship to smithereens. Or it might just be so heavy, a lot of these ships were overloaded with stuff they were never meant to carry, that when the ship was torpedoed, it would just go straight to the bottom. And a lot of the men uh, that died in these ships never even had a chance to get out of their quarters. They were just entombed at the bottom of the sea. If you did get out, if you were on the main deck or you managed to get out of the main deck while the attack was taking place, you might find a scene something like this. There's fire all around you. The ship is listing. You know, the deck is at a steep angle. Um, you might, it's very difficult to launch lifeboats or rafts under those circumstances, even if you've been practicing it. The ocean might be rough. It might be freezing cold. It might be full of sharks. And it might even be on fire, because in many cases, particularly when an oil tanker was torpedoed, as many were off Cape Hatteras, the cargo, the oil or the gasoline, would spill out of the storage tanks onto the water, it would float, and it would ignite. So you would have a flaming oil slick surrounding the sinking ship. And any man who tried to jump off the ship to save himself and landed in this oil slick would be severely burned, if not killed, outright. If you did get away from all of this and you got into a raft or a, on a lifeboat, your problems might just be beginning. Because if you've seen Captain Phillips, a modern lifeboat is enclosed. You know, it's designed to help you survive. But these World War II lifeboats were wide open at the top. They were open to the elements. A breaking wave would drench everybody in the lifeboat. They were open to the cold and the rain and the snow and the wind and the broiling heat. And the men in the lifeboat might have to be in the lifeboat for days or weeks and sometimes even months. Some of these lifeboats drifted for thousands of miles, just hoping they'd be lucky enough to cross paths with a ship that would rescue them or that the lifeboat would crunch onto a remote shore somewhere where the men could bushwhack their way through the brush or the jungle or whatever and get help. So escaping a sinking ship like this was a gauntlet of horrors that you had to run through. But a lot of men did survive. And they would survive, and they would go home, and they would get right back on other ships, and they would go back out again. And they would sail through, in many cases, the same waters that they'd been torpedoed in. And they would be torpedoed again. Hundreds of these men were torpedoed multiple times. One guy was torpedoed 10 times. And the... Um, this ship here is the second of three ships to be torpedoed out from under one of the Matthews County sea captains named Mellon Respus. And Mellon survived the first torpedoing pretty well. This one, he was injured. Uh, he was hospitalized for a couple of months. And when he finally got well enough to travel again, he was uh, riding as a passenger on another Matthews sea captain's ship and that ship was torpedoed. So, one of the most surprising things that I found, uh, maybe the most surprising thing in my research, is this picture shows it. If, if you look, this, in the foreground here, this rail is a U-boat. So this is a U-boat approaching 
some men on a raft. And it was very common for U-boats to torpedo ships and then approach the survivors on a raft or in a lifeboat. And the reason the Germans did this was information. They would pull the U-boat right up to this, like this raft, um, glare down at these helpless men from the conning tower, pull out a machine gun, and interrogate them. What was the name of your ship? What was your cargo? What was your destination? What was the tonnage of your ship? What was its cargo capacity? And when they got the answers, and a lot of times these guys would lie to them, but when they'd get the answers, frequently the sub would move away and leave men like this to the mercy of the sea, which in many cases was no mercy at all. But a number of U-boat captains, and I have a number of examples in the book, could not bring themselves to do this. They couldn't bring themselves to sink a ship in a remote stretch of ocean and then just leave the men there to die. They were dedicated to sinking the ship, but once all the cargo was on the bottom and the men were helpless, the U-boat captains would approach them and they'd offer them food, water. Uh, they'd pull, occasionally pull a guy out of the ocean and put him in a lifeboat. They'd give the castaways the course to the nearest land. They'd even offer to tow them part of the way. Uh, my favorite example, one I cite in the book, is one of the three Hammond brothers has just been torpedoed. He's in a lifeboat. It's in the Caribbean. And he looks up and suddenly a U-boat surfaces right next to them. And everybody on the lifeboat must have been thinking, this is the end. But instead, the U-boat commander starts out by apologizing for having sunk their ship. And he gives them food. He gives them 40 packs of German cigarettes gives them a big box of French cookies because the U-boat had been based in occupied France. He gives them a big 10-gallon jug of drinking water. And before he hands over the drinking water, he squeezes fresh limes into the water. And the reason he's doing this is to introduce vitamin C into this water to fortify these castaways against scurvy, a vitamin deficiency disease, in the event their lifeboat has to be at sea for a long time. As the U-boat is pulling away, the U-boat commander calls out, come and see me in Germany after the war, after this is all over. So, another U-boat commander astonishes the men in a lifeboat by, after interrogating them about their ship, asks them how the Brooklyn Dodgers baseball team has been doing. He, the German, lived with his parents in Brooklyn before the war and had become a Dodgers fan. But I don't want to give you the impression that the U-boat war was some sort of clubby, chummy affair. It really wasn't. Um, these examples I've cited were the exceptions, not the rule. And at the core of the U-boat war, it was simply brutal. And I don't think anything illustrates it maybe better than this photograph right here. And this is a close-up of the last photograph that we saw, the same men on the raft. Now, these men are the only survivors there's seven of them, the only survivors of a torpedoed oil tanker called the Muskogee. The Muskogee was torpedoed hundreds of miles offshore in the deep ocean. Um, as you can see, the, and these are the only guys that got off the ship alive. The, as you can see, the water is rough. It's March, so it's cold. Um, the raft is really nothing than a wooden platform nailed to some floating drums. So it's better than swimming, but it is not going to keep these guys alive for very long in this situation. And looking at the picture, and in the book, the picture is there's a little smaller version. I think you can see a little better. But to me, the knowledge that these guys are doomed is written on some of their faces. Some of them are calling out to the U-boat. You know, it's not clear if they're calling out in defiance or if they're calling for assistance. But other of the men, they're not, they're just staring. They're not looking at the camera. They're not looking at the U-boat. They're just staring off in the middle distance because they know that nothing can save them out there. And nothing did. None of these men was ever seen again. None of the 34 men on the Muskogee was ever heard from again. The Allies didn't even know what happened to the Muskogee. It just didn't show up in port when it was supposed to. And after a few weeks, it was... Uh, listed as missing, presumed sunk by submarine. 
Um, these men's loved ones went to their graves without ever knowing any more than that. And that happened to 33 different American ships during the U-boat war, just torpedoed in far reaches of the ocean, witnessed only by the men who destroyed them, who didn't have any reason or inclination to, uh, to report what happened to them. Interestingly, the Muscogee's fate did become known, the fate of this ship. In the 1980s, the son of the Muscogee's captain, a man named George Betts from Maine, got hold of some uh, declassified Navy documents and figured out which U-boat had sunk his father's ship. He tracked down the U-boat commander, who was a retiree living in Germany, and he wrote him a letter. And he wrote, I don't blame you for killing my father. It was an act of war. But I would like to know what happened. So the U-boat commander wrote him back, and he arranged for him to get some of these photos. And he gave him an account. He said, yes, I torpedoed your father's ship. My crew and I regretted having to leave these men to die out here. We gave them some food. We gave them some water. But we didn't have room to take them aboard. We barely had room you know, for our own guys. And anyway, we were on our way to the coast of the United States to start our mission. So we had no choice. Um, Mr. Betts, the son of the captain, didn't stop there. He spent the next two years tracking down family members of all 34 men who had been on the ship to share them with them what he had learned from the U-boat commander. And most of the fa and he caught he found like grand nieces and distant cousins, you know, whoever he could find. He was on the he was featured on the TV show Unsolved Mysteries once, trying to do this. But he finally got hold of somebody from every family. And most of the families were very grateful. They wrote him letters saying, thank you for doing this. At least after all these years, we know something. And they even helped him identify two of the guys on the raft. So we know who two of them are, two of the last survivors of the Muscogee. But not all the families were glad to hear from him. And one of the families he wrote to was the family of Nat Foster, who was from Matthews County. And Mr. Betts thought that Nat Foster was one of the guys on the raft. He thought he was the fourth guy from the left. And he wrote to one of Nat's sisters, said, can you please confirm that this is Nat? And he got back a very short letter. And it said, we cannot confirm this, and we do not wish to receive any further information. So not everybody wanted to relive the horrors of the U-boat war. I wanted to tell you, I gave this a talk like this in Raleigh a couple of weeks ago. And I know, as I was talking about Nat Foster, I noticed that a woman in one of the front rows was, just seemed very emotional. And she told me afterwards that she was Nat Foster's niece. And she had come to the talk having no idea I was going to say anything about him. She had never seen the picture, had never known what happened to him. So it's, just, it's, been, it's been kind of an amazing, um, some of the people I've met. Um, a lot, there are a lot of unusual stories like that in this book, and some of them have never been told anywhere, some of them not been told very widely, and the reason they haven't been is they haven't taken place during famous battles that have been well chronicled, but they've taken place on these lonely encounters out at sea with like, you know, U-boat commanders and people in lifeboats or just people in lifeboats. There is a story in the, um, the book about the lifeboat baby. This is the lifeboat baby. This is a baby who was born in a lifeboat at sea after his mother's ship was torpedoed in a storm off Cape Hatteras. And he is pictured in, this, in here with his mother and with his four-year-old sister, who was also in the lifeboat at the time. There is a story in here about the, um, a ship's engineer, a resourceful guy who saved the lives of everybody in his lifeboat by using little odds and ends from the lifeboat to build a still, which he used to convert seawater into drinkable water. And there's an account in the book about Ernest Hemingway's adventures during the U-boat war. And some of you may know that Ernest Hemingway in 1942 was living in Cuba and happily fishing for marlin aboard his beloved fishing boat, the Pilar. But Hemingway somehow persuaded American authorities to issue him a machine gun, and a bunch of hand grenades. 
and, allow, and commission him to patrol the coast of Cuba for U-boats. Now, Hemingway's idea was that if a U-boat got close enough, he would pull out the machine gun, sweep the deck, chase the Germans down the hatch, throw the hand grenades in after them, and destroy the U-boat. Now, I'll leave it to you to conclude how good of a plan you thought that was, but <laughs> Hemingway, as it turned out, never got anywhere near a U-boat. And it was probably a good thing, because at that point, he had yet to write The Old Man in the Sea. Now, he did get enough information from, he actually did patrol the coast of Cuba, and he got enough information to write another novel called Islands in the Stream. And it's not one of his better known novels, but it's uh, in the novel, the, a very Hemingway-like protagonist hunts U-boats in a fishing boat off the coast of Cuba. Um, I bet I'd like to tell you a lot of these stories, but I, I hopefully I'll, you know, I'll save them, and hopefully you'll read them in the book. I do want to show you one last um, picture. And this is a uh, recruiting poster created by the government for the Merchant Marine during World War II. And it, what it says is, you bet I'm going back to sea. And it shows a tough merchant mariner. And what he means is that he's, he's going to keep sailing. You know, he could quit. He could do something else. But despite the torpedoings, despite the dangers, maybe despite the fact that some of his shipmates have been killed, he's going to keep doing it because somebody has to carry that stuff across the ocean. And that was pretty much what the Merchant Marine did during World War II. They just kept sailing. But what strikes me about this is the image of the mariner. And if you look at him, he's a tough-looking guy, but he also looks a little, I don't know, a little seedy, maybe not quite right, maybe not the kind of guy necessarily you'd want to bring home to a family dinner. And that was the image of the U.S. Merchant Marine during World War II. I mean, they were looked down upon. One mariner wrote, we were identified with uh, rot gut whiskey and bar waterfront barroom brawls. And they were looked down on. Some of the Navy leaders said they were undisciplined. You know, they weren't members of the Navy. They didn't follow orders. They were careless. They were responsible for their ships getting torpedoed. Other... Uh, Men in the military complained they got paid too much. Again, they were union guys. They got paid bonuses for sailing in war zones and with hauling explosives. But mariners didn't get paid the way most people got paid. They got paid when a voyage began, and they stopped getting paid as soon as it ended, even if it ended with a torpedo strike in the middle of the ocean. So they would be on their own time when they were swimming for their lives. So it's very, it's really different. But and some people called them draft dodgers because they didn't join the military. But that was a ridiculous argument that they were, this was somehow a cushy job because the merchant marine had a higher casualty rate than any branch of the U.S. military. The only ones that came close were the U.S. Marines. But regardless, some of this complaints and some of the mud stuck. And at the end of the war, um, they weren't welcomed home as heroes. They weren't even home for the victory parades. They were still on their ships because the war didn't end for them. They were bringing the troops home. When they finished that, they were hauling materials over to Europe to help rebuild Europe after the war. So while they were gone, they didn't have a lot of powerful friends in Congress. They were left out of the GI Bill and really left out of all government benefits of any kind for decades. Um, now there are efforts in Congress to try to do something about this years after the fact, but these legislation never really seems to go anywhere, and I think that's a shame. But honestly, the Matthews men, the Mariners that I interviewed, I don't think they even knew there was legislation or anything going on. I think they gave up long ago expecting the government to come back after all these years and say, here, you know, we should, here's something for you. But a lot of them told me that they would like people in general to know that they did something. One guy told me, he said, maybe when your book comes out, uh, maybe my grandkids will finally believe I did something useful during the war. But the time, even for that, is growing very short. When I started working on this book in earnest in 2011, there were maybe 15 or so old Matthews men, merchant mariners, who had sailed against the U-boats living in and around Matthews County. Today, there's maybe four or five. And one of my favorite Matthews men, Bill Callis, 
Uh, the last thing he told me, he said, if you, you want me to read this book you're writing, you better hurry up and write it. <laughs> and I said, uh, I said, all right, Bill. But a few weeks later, I went to his funeral. So it's a little bittersweet for me to be working on this and doing it because um, I, uh, I'm very proud of the book. I wanted to write a book since I was about five years old, and I'm happy with the way this one turned out. But I wish it had not taken me so long to figure out how to tell this story. I wish I had figured it out um, 20 years ago. That's uh, about all I have to say. And uh, 